Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure. It will be a bit long, but I hope not boring. So uh, there will be four parts. The first part will be about what is, how do I consider and where do I see the major problem which we are facing. The second part will be on natural resources, how we use them. The third, how this is connected to climate change and how can it contribute to solving that problem. And the final will be about the circular economy. So let's start with the story in my own country, Slovenia, with a quote from last year of uh, famous Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek, who said it's clear that we are approaching the ecological and digital apocalypse, but we should not lose nerves. And he actually continued with the quote of Mao Zedong, uh, which goes like that, everything under heaven, it's in utter chaos. The situation is excellent. So, let me explain you a bit uh, how do I see the, that utter chaos, what, is ex actually the, what are actually the things which we have to take into account. We all got used to the fact that we will be 9, 7 point uh, till mid of the century population. If I translate it to the human language, that means in one year additional Germany on the planet, in four years additional United States of America, in nine days and six hours, my country. All that will be happening in least developed part of the world, all. And that means that the pressure on the use of the resources will be enormous because they have all the right to live and to aspire to live in the way we do. Second, the world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people and 22 richest men have more wealth than all the 326 million women in Africa. This was released just uh, a month or two ago in Davos, of course. We throw away one third of the food we produce, which means one third of the land, one third of energy, one third of pesticides, one third of everything. More than half of the cities which will exist in 2050 have not yet been built. China has used in three years more cement than the United States of America during the whole 20th century. Climate change experts are warning us that if we do not halve our emissions till 2030, we can forget 1.5 degrees. To be honest, I think we can forget it. Biodiversity, according to Living Planet Index, 60% fall in just last 40 years. Biomass of the mammals living in the nature has been reduced in the recent decades for 82%, according to, I, uh, to IPBS report, which was released 2019. A million of plastic bottles are bought every minute, 9% recycled, 12 incinerated, practically 80% still landfills. Drinking only bottled water, one consumes 130,000 plastic particles per year from that source alone, compared to 4,000 if you are drinking it from the tap. So we are the first generation more likely to die as a result of a lifestyle choices than the infectious disease. The thing which you should never forget is that we are the first generation on the planet which is living in socio-ecological space of planetary scope. Nobody before us was living in that conditions. My father was still using a horse to travel with a wagon to the nearest town, which was 20 kilometers from us. This means that we are more interconnected, more interdependent than ever, and that our individual and collective responsibility has enormously increased for the future. This was very nicely explained by the Club of Rome, saying that we moved from empty world, which was dominated by nature, to the full world, which is dominated by humans. In the empty world, it was labor and infrastructure, which were the limiting factors of human well-being. Now, it is natural resources and environmental sinks which are limiting factors of human well-being. So if somebody wants to talk only about economics, he or she should not forget that the limiting factor of future economics is actually environment. So that's the way how we normally approach in science to the questions which are related to environment. So DPSIR framework, which many of you probably know, D for, stands for drivers, P for pressures, S for state, I for impacts, and R for response. When we talk about climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, we basically talk about the state and impact. But if you really want to change 
the situation, you need to go back to the drivers and pressures. And immediately when you say driver and pressure, you say human and human activity, which is called, as you know, economics. Why that's important? Because, so, uh, what we try to do in International Resource Panel, which I'm co-chairing, is basically connect the competitiveness story, the economic story, which is very much based on how you use the resources, with the uh, effects, which, with the consequences, which are climate change and so on, which again, it's pretty much connected to that, how irresponsibly you use the resources. Why that is important? Because the policies are different, and this leads me then to the economy as a core problem to which we have to look if we really want to change the reality. Probably the best explanation of what is wrong in our economy could be seen from this slide. It was its inclusive wealth index. It was published by United States, uh, United Nations uh, in 2018. Inclusive wealth index has, contrary to GDP, three components. The first component is production capital, which is this, this is per capita, that dotted line. This line is actually GDP per capita. It means that production, productive capital is actually a synonym for GDP. Then the second is human capital per capita, that's this blue dotted line. And the third one is natural capital per capita. In the last 22 years, according to UN statistics, production capital per capita has almost doubled. Human capital per capita is almost stand still and natural capital per capita has decreased for almost 40%. So, the conclusion that the growth which we are recording in the last decades was more or less achieved due to the depletion of natural capital, it's not so difficult. So, we are indebting terribly future generations. If I simplify the story, what is happening on our markets, you know that we are living in a market economy. Producers and consumers apparently behave rationally. That's what I was teaching uh, 20 years. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, by the way, it's very rational assumption because humans have never in the history behaved rationally. Uh, so you have the incentives which are sent to the market. So it's the price signals on the basis of which actually the equilibria is decided, the quantity which is then used. And what are the signals if we connect the previous slide with this one? Production capital overvalued and overrewarded, human capital undervalued, underrewarded, and natural capital not valued at all. And if somebody thinks that we will get from that signals which we are sending on the market, economic, social, and environmental situation which is in balance, he or she should wake up. It will never happen. So, that's the basics of the problem which we are facing. So, according to European Environment Agency, economic system should be the system, should be the function of the ecosystem. And the major problem of that slide is, of course, uh, hidden in environmental externalities. When I was environment commissioner, I've heard many times you cannot introduce that and that because it has certain additional economic costs. My dear friends, these are not additional costs. These are existing, but we don't. We hide them, we simply don't calculate them. That's the problem, they are existing. So what we do is we privatize the profits and socialize the costs. And in many cases, actually those costs are paid by the future generations. Why by the future generations? Because they cannot complain. So if we now move to the European Union developments and see what it's the latest, which is, which is on the table. You know the priorities, uh, European Green Deal, an economy, uh, an economy that works for people, Europe fit for the digital age, protecting our European way of life, a stronger Europe in the world, and finally a new push for European democracy. Actually, the idea is to connect very much the Green Deal and the digital age and to search for the answers through that angle. The Green Deal, it's uh, basically, that's the structure. I will not go into detail. I will just share with you some things which I think they are important to remember. It is indeed a new logic. It is indeed a new approach and new political narrative. When I was commissioner, I was two terms as science and then as environment. 
in the college meeting, I tried to introduce to the narrative which we discussed, the narrative of growth and jobs. Just one single word, sustainable, and I never succeeded. So this commission has really starting from different kind of angle, and they deserve appreciation for that. A lot of attention is given in the document to social considerations of the transition, the thing which each of us have to remember. Environmental, ecological transition will succeed or will fly or fall on the basis how we will solve the social questions. If we will organize the transition in a way like you have seen, for example, in the France some time ago, when actually the measures were good but done in the wrong way, we will never succeed. So keep in mind, social considerations of the transition will be critical issue of the overall transition. How do I see major problems? There is clearly a gap between the ambition set in the opening in the, of the document and strategic vision for the needed system changes in the following concrete policy chapters. Second, there is clearly an inconsistency existing among the ambition set in the document and the fact that the budget, the MFF, was prepared by the previous commission. So either the previous commission was as ambitious as this one or something doesn't work, which obviously doesn't work. Next document, it's climate biased. While biodiversity and zero pollution are addressed only in specific chapters, climate is mainstreamed through the whole document. Nothing is wrong with climate, but it's a missed opportunity because the three things are very much interconnected. The need for prices and costs of products and services must move to incorporate environmental health and costs, so externalities. They are not included in a systemic way. The so the commitment to change the way we measure growth, progress, and well-being is simply missing. And without that, the compass will still be wrong. The link to the importance of decoupling resource use, water, land, materials from economic growth for an effective climate policy is still not clear. Clear orientation in the direction of dematerialization, rethinking the concept of ownership, moving from resource efficiency to sufficiency is missing. I will explain to you later why that's very important. So all the chapters on food buildings and mobility are really designed without a real system change logic and needs. I can explain you also later if you would wish why. In biodiversity chapter, a lot of attention is on reforestation and afforestation concepts which will need quite a lot of clarifications. The importance of finance and innovative thinking is present but not convincing enough. And finally, there are clearly the gaps existing when it comes to global governance. What I'm pushing constantly is something like a convention on natural resource management because I firmly believe that we need the alignment on a global level if we want to move the whole story ahead. So the Green Deal in short, it's a promising start, but a long road ahead. What, uh, of course, might become a real problem, it was delivered very quickly, as it will be a lot of proposals which are currently coming on the table, which means that the real ownership behind will not be there. And uh, getting the ownership later on, it's much more difficult than in the production. But in summary, commission needs, in the first place, an appreciation of the work done and a sincere help in filling some of the gaps identified. So they don't need now very bold critics because they have done a bold step, but they need help to fill the gaps. You should read the annual sustainable growth strategy in connection to that. By the way, some of the things there are pretty progressive. An economy must work for the people and the planet. That was never written by the commission before. It's a new growth model that will respect the limitations of our natural resources and ensure job creation and lasting prosperity for the future. This requires bringing together four dimensions, environment, productivity, stability, and fairness. Environment, sustainability, productivity gains, fairness, and macroeconomic stability will be four dimensions of our policy. That's how they have actually designed it, but you can all find it in that document. In short, I think that the narrative for change could be better explained, so they do not connect that enough with competitiveness, which it's relatively easy to be done. Resource focus is missing also here. 
The document has no external dimension of growth. It's practically impossible to address the, the growth in European Union without really talking about trade, without talking about the relations which we have with the rest of the world. And this is the thing which is practically, which directs a lot of attention from my side. When you look into detail, the document is pretty clear that in the years 2010, 2019, when we were after the economic crisis, when the whole Europe was growing fast, the social gap inside the countries between the richest and the poorest in income distribution has increased. 